Welcome back to part two of our interview with Frank Masseri from Smog Veil Records. So we just heard the cut Marilyn Monroe by Gary Lupico in California Speedbag, and that brings back good memories to all, for all of us. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gary, touched, Gary touched us all. Um, oh, but, yeah. So after all those projects that you did with Rocket from the Tombs, um, the, the reformation, the touring, and all that, did, is that where you kind of developed a relationship with Dave Tom, David Thomas to oh, yeah. um, start yeah. to issue the Pure Ubu catalog, uh, the yeah. Pure Ubu releases that you did? So talk yeah, to me a little so, bit about that. <clears throat> So, um, you know, we, we, you know, we did, I think a great job with Rocker from the Tombs and, uh, you know, the, uh, they went, the Rocker from the Tombs went into the studio, recorded a record. We released that record. Um, and that really started, a uh, you know, sort of a business friendship with David Thomas and, you know, David liked what we were doing. I've always been a fan of Per Ubu. Um, so it, it was, it was a logical fit. Per Ubu was making new recordings, um, and David was looking for a label in North America, and it was just the perfect fit, and we thought, why not? And so we released a couple Per Ubu records. Uh, we released a David Thomas and Two Pale Boys records, um, and David had all, you know, David also had a basically a giant vault of recordings, live recordings, studio recordings that never got released some of which were bootlegged and he was concerned about that and i thought well why don't we bootleg the bootleggers why don't we you know digital downloads were becoming the, a popular format why don't we create a website our own digital download website um and david could release rare recordings of per ubu live recordings he could basically release whatever he wanted. It didn't really matter to me because he has a really great sense of, you know, what the band should sound like and what the record should sound like and, and what recordings are sort of the definitive recordings of different eras of Per Ubu. And so I got together with Rod from the Rubber City Rebels, who's kind of an internet tech wizard, and we created this website, hairpin.com, where David could release uh, recordings out of his vault. And it, it was very, very, very popular. It was very lucrative for us and for him because, you know, it, we didn't have to split with a digital distributor. We could keep, you know, split the money between ourselves. And it, 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 was, it was great. I mean, it, it was, it was. It was a fun time to be in business with David Thomas. And David, even to this day, remains a friend. And he, he's still making Per Ubu records. And really? I, the guy, the guy is amazing. I always thought the guy is amazing. He has a unique voice. He has a way to sort of bring together these like disparate uh, influences and, and make it uniquely his own. And so I've, you know, I've been a fan forever, and, and really, uh, you know, I, you, you can't say enough about the, fer the very first Perubu LP, Modern Dance. I mean, it, it's a classic. You know, the songs on there, I mean, if you really just sit down and listen to those songs, they rock so hard. I mean, it really is a great, great rock and roll record. And so Absolutely. it's and easy. And you didn't know that when it first came, when it first, when it came out you were kind of entrenched in the hard, not hardcore at all, but punk, a lot of guitar. There was, you know, and, you know, Devo was kind of doing what they did, but, and there was that, you know, people were lumping in Cleveland in 77, eight, nine. It was Devo and Perubu, Devo and Perubu. That's who, it was mm -hmm. that side of the band, right? That side of the, 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 yeah. the river, as it were. And then there was Pagans, Dead Boys, that side, you know. So Pirubu came out, and it was it it, it did. To, and it, the, when you first heard it, you were like, "Wow, this is cool!" And it was different. You knew it had pedigree, so oh, you, yeah. you liked it because of its pedigree. Oh, but yeah. it but then all of the instrumentation just started taking over, and you heard the nuances behind it. And it wasn't just a bass, a humbucker, guitar, drums, and somebody screaming. Right. 
there was screaming and there was singing and there was guitar leads and there was distant guitars and there was yeah. you know clarinets going funky ass wild and there was Scott playing crazy drum beats but it was just not your typical sound that we that anybody was used to no you know no. at all no i mean it, it, i mean turn on nine alignment packed and crank First it up cut, right i mean it's it's just it just jumps out of the Absolutely. speakers. Just jumps out of the speakers. <laughs> Did that too many times. Too many times. Uh, so, if we fast forward now back uh, up to um, probably what two thousand four. That's when one of your fa- I know you're a big Rubber City Rebels fan. Oh yeah. Uh, and they reformed. They got back together around yeah. two thousand four, and they recorded a record exclusively exclusively for Smog Vale. Correct. Yeah, they reformed. Rubber City Re- Rubber Rubber City Rebels have a long history. I mean, the, the band's out of Akron, but they played in Cleveland a lot. They had this bar down in Akron, the Crypt, uh, where you know Dead Boys played, Devo played. Um, you know, it was the punk rock bar to play out in Akron, and the band. You know, they they. At the time, you know, uh, bands were sort of, there was a lot of interest in what was happening in Akron. The band moves to L.A., um, gets a major deal, I think it was on Capitol, records a record, and then just sort of disintegrates. The record kind of goes nowhere, even though it's a great record, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it goes nowhere. And, and so, you know, fast forward to, and this was, I don't know, 1980. Yeah. Fast forward to 2004, they reform. They're all good players. I mean, everybody everybody in that band is just a fantastic musician. Um, fast forward to 2004, they record a new record, and they come to me and say, "Hey, let's we got this new record, and um, we're looking for a label. Why don't you be the record label?" And I was like, "Well, you know, I was kind of set." doing reissues nonstop and retrospectives and not really releasing new music. And I thought, yeah, why not? And the thing about the Rubber City Rebels is that they were really good at licensing their music for other purposes other than a record. So I don't know if anyone realizes, knows this, remembers this, but when back in their original incarnation, they were in a movie, tagged the assassination, Tag the assassination game with Linda ha- Linda Hamilton. It was her first movie. <laughs> if you could find it, especially a VHS copy, buy it. You know, it's 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 a great movie, and they're all they're all over it. But um, so there was opportunity here, and and they were willing to go on tour. They had an attorney that they were working with that could license their stuff. So they licensed a song for the very first. Uh, Tony Hawk video game, uh, th- you know, we eventually licensed it, some songs from that record for for films, and, y- you know, they they toured Europe a couple times, we licensed the record to another label in Europe, and, and these were, these were, these were, you know, fun things to do, and by fun, I, I mean, they resulted in selling lots of records, and, they got an offer to tour Japan. And so I thought, yeah, I've never been to Japan. So Lisa and I decide to go, uh, to meet up with the band and, and, and go along with them on the tour. Bob Ritchie, uh, from the pink holes and the pagans met up with us. He had never been to Japan. And so it it was, it was a blast. I mean, it it was, it, it was just a blast. And, you know, it, that kind of made me realize, though, that, look, I can expand the label, but I need help. So I brought on Ilka Pardinius and her company, Fly PR, to handle the press because these demands got to be pretty large. I mean, it, it, it's it's really hard for a two-person operation to take care of all the mail order, take care of all the distributor work, take care of all the press work, take care of all the tour work. And it, it becomes a lot of a lot, a lot of work to do all this stuff and so we got to be big enough where we can bring on Ilka and it really helped uh, grow the awareness and and stature of the label and so when I was in Japan with the Rubber City Rebels I tried to make as many contacts as I could because I kind of thought well 
you know, there's a lot of smaller labels in Japan that are probably looking for a distributor for the United States. And I tried to make as many contacts as I could, and I became a distributor for 1977 records in Japan, which was a reissue label. Um, Wizard and Vinyl, which was a reissue label. And then that label licensed a bunch of stuff from the Rubber City Rebels in return. Um, Target Earth, which was uh, a label that had Teen Generate as their biggest band. And so, you know, it, it was a way to grow. The, it, it was an opportunity to grow, and I grew it. Was there, I mean, there clearly was an advantage to being an attorney when you're dealing with all these things. Um, did, and does that save the record, co- you know, like your typical record company that has to deal with licenses and publishing? The, do they retain attorneys? I mean, I'm real, I'm real naive to this stuff. And how much did that background that you have really become an asset in growing Smog Vale? Well, I mean, the simple of it is, I mean, yeah, I'm an attorney. Uh, to do these deals, you you know, you have to have a written agreement. It's best to have a written agreement, although sometimes we did them on handshakes. And fortunately, the handshakes never blew up. But, but yeah, I mean, a lot of these deals, you, you try to have written agreements and as an attorney, I, you know, I became familiar with the terms of these agreements and I was able to, you know, draft up these agreements uh, and not hire outside attorneys, which would be an incredibly big expense. And so, yeah, that helped. Um, I mean, that's you know, an advantage and, that a lot of labels probably didn't have, especially, you know, you weren't huge, you know, but you weren't small, small. So, you no. know, a lot of those in-between labels... That's just an expense that, you know, somebody has to encumber. It, oh, yeah. Mean. I mean, you know, if you're a small label and the best you can do is sell 300 or 500 records, you, you really can't afford uh, to hire an attorney. And mm-hmm. even if you can sell 5,000 records, you know, you still you still really anything. can't afford to hire an attorney. So, mm-hmm. But if you can do the work in-house, right. if you have an understanding of, what these agreements should contain, uh, y- you know, you, you, you can help yourself. And, th- and then if, if you can make contacts within the industry with people that license, like I said, for films or video games, I mean, that's, if you can do that, it's, it's real good money for the label. Right. And then you could use that money to sort of expand out your horizons, hire some people to help you with like the press and, and the tours and stuff and merchandising and stuff like that. And, and that's, that's kind of what we did. And, you know, and also, you know, we, then I saw that there were, you know, opportunities to do stuff outside of Cleveland to, to bring on some projects that weren't really Cleveland centric. And so we, we kind of grew the label that way too. You know, we, 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 we had projects that, you know, weren't based in Northeast Ohio, and, and some of those were really, really successful. Yeah, Complaints Choir was one. Weren't they, were they a non-Ohio band? Yeah, so, so Complaints Choir was really the biggest non-Ohio project that we ever did. So Com- Complaints Choir was uh, uh, an art, it was, it was a performance art, project that was created by a husband and wife performance art team from Helsinki. I don't know how I found about it, but the second I found out about it, I, I tracked them down. What it is, is the this husband and wife, they partner with a arts organization in, in some city and put together a choir, the lyrics of which are made from uh, complaints that people submit in writing to the arts organization, they 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 put the they put together a choir of volunteers. Um, they usually hire a composer or some musicians in that town to take the uh, complaints and and put them in the form of lyrics and music. And they have four or five rehearsals uh, with the choir and the musicians, and then they do a public performance. And I thought, wow, this is a really fun and cool idea. It's not punk rock. It's not rock and roll. It's it's a choir. And I was li- my wife and I were living in Chicago at the time. And 
I, I proposed this I, I what I, I proposed this idea to the director of the Chicago Humanities Festival and he loved it you know and and so the husband and wife team they had never been to the United States to do the project they were eager to do so we were able to get art grants uh, from uh, uh, art organizations in Helsinki and in, fin uh, in, in Finland and we brought them over to the United States, put the choir together and, and did this performance all over as part of the Humanities Festival and then all over the city. And then we also did a performance at the Empty Bottle. We were the headline band for a gig at the Empty Bottle, but we had one song that was five minutes long. So we performed it, I think, three or four times. <laughs> and that was our gig. And But, but, they, but the husband and wife team, uh, Tolervo, and Oliver, they told me about this documentary filmmaker that was eager to make a documentary film about Complaints Square because they had done it all around the world. Mm -hmm. And so I got in touch with these people. They were Danish. I got in touch with them. They were like, yeah, look, can we, if we can put the financing together, we can make the film. And we'll, we'll follow the Complaints Square in Chicago. And then Tolervo and Oliver got an offer to do it in Singapore. The filmmaker said, we'll follow them to Singapore and we'll, the documentary film will be about the performance in Chicago and the performance in Singapore. The thing is, when you got to Singapore, things a little, went a little bit off the rails because in Singapore, when you do a live music performance, the lyrics have to be submitted uh, to the police to be approved. And the police did not approve the lyrics, even though they, they weren't. They didn't criticize the government because the complaints choir, wherever you do this anywhere in the world, People generally complain about relationships, public transportation, and just their neighbors. And so, you know, given the opportunity to complain about anything you want, most people complain about those three things. And so the lyrics themselves weren't controversial, but the police didn't approve it. And it got kind of dicey, and we were a little concerned about the, the safety of the filmmakers and Tolero and Oliver and the people who participated in the choir. And so the only performance they were allowed to do was a private performance uh, in a small hall for friends and family, and that was it. And so that incident actually became the basis of a United States State Department report that was authored by Hillary Clinton about artists' rights and free speech, free speech rights in Singapore. And the... Uh, Tolervo and Oliver were later featured in 60 Minutes. I appeared in that 60 Minutes segment about the Complaints Choir. And it really, it really kind of was a big deal. And I was really proud to be part of it. I was honored to be part of it. And, you know, it, it was, it, it was, it was eye-opening. It was intellectually challenging. And it was something that I'm really happy that I did. And, and I'm really happy that my wife and I were able to put it together. Wow. That's a great story. I'm glad I asked about it. I, yeah. <laughs> it was just kind of happenstance, really. Just knowing yeah. from the release and knowing from being in contact with you during that period, knowing you were working on that project and never until now really knew what that was. I thought it yeah. was another fucking Stemple band or something. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I hate Miley Cyrus. I hate her a lot. This is the reason. She made my little sister love her songs and now listen to her singing. What I'm telling you, it's really irritating. This is very unrealistic. Why don't they show a picture of somebody that would look more like me. Oh my goodness, you guys, life hates me. Just because you don't have towels doesn't mean that the world's gonna stop turning tomorrow. I should be having a real job, you know? Being a real movie. I'll just... <laughs> something to, to complain about. This is a movie about
complaining. Hey, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to run back to uh, <clears throat> play a really cool song that was off of that Rubber City Rebels re-release, right? Called Pierce My Brain. Oh, no, that was one of their new, that was a new oh, that, recording. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Off the re oh, not a re-release. I'm sorry. The, the, yeah. record, the 2004 recording that they did. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I still hear that on... Uh, uh, underground garage i mean you know oh yeah uh, it's, it's serious and plays the shit out of rubber you hear them more than dead boys when you on, on little steve you know you know and, um of all the releases we ever did i mean 147 releases so there's you know 2000 at least 2000 songs in the catalog that is the number one most downloaded or streamed song in the catalog not Crazy Slut by Pink Holes. No. No, but that's a good one, too. <laughs> that's a real good one. All right, let's listen to Pierce My Brain by Rubber City Rebels, and we'll come back with Frank. I want to pierce my brain. just heard pierce my brain by the rubber city rebels and that was released by smogvale in 2004 you say so um i know right around then you decided to take some time away from the business a little bit and you and least traveled the world and your personal uh, uh goal was to never step on a plane and look like i'll get on a boat to fucking fish i will hunt ducks I ain't crossing the sea in a tub. When I had my chance to join the military, I wasn't joining the fucking Navy. Hell no, a thousand hairy-legged motherfuckers on the boat with me. I don't want any part of that. So I want to know about this trip. I know it has, it, it has shit all to do with music, but it has so much to do with you, and I think it's important. But where'd you start and where'd you stop? How long did it take? Did you go around Cape Horn? Were there any sailboats involved? What cultures yeah. did you dig? And talk yeah. about the music in these foreign places, because every time I've traveled overseas... The music fucking always comes back with me, man. So give me five, ten so, minutes on all that shit. Yeah, so, you know, my wife and I hadn't, at this point, we hadn't taken a vacation in like ten years. I mean, the business of the label was really all-consuming. And so, I, you know, we wanted to we wanted to get out. The, la the last travels we had did were all business-related. You know, I mean, like going to Japan with Rubber City Rebels sounds like fun, but it was fun, but there was a lot of business involved. You know, Complaints Choir, the documentary came out, you know, we, we, we took it on the festival circuit, you know, I made a couple of appearances at festivals where the film had played, and, you know, I, I just got this traveling bug, and I thought, you know, let's, let's, let's take a vacation, but make it like this massive vacation, since we hadn't done anything in 10 years, and so we decided, hey, let's, let's, 
let's travel around the world without flying. You know, it's this personal challenge that we set for ourselves. And we started in Chicago, traveled east, went across the Atlantic, ended up in England, went to Scandinavia. So, you know, we, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, the Faroes, Sweden, went down to the Baltics. Estonia and Latvia with, with, you know, absolutely no expectations of what we might find in these places, but they were just like the most fabulous places to go on vacation to. And, you know, we, we, we set aside enough time in each place so we could actually like see it and spend some time there. Did some, it wasn't, it wasn't a music business trip, but we did a lot of music stuff. I mean, we went to, you know, uh, symphonies, we went to a John Cage, a student John Cage music competition in Estonia which was you know which was incredible you know I mean incre- yeah. it's something that you can do for free too we walked yeah. into it it was incredible uh, went to Russia took a train across Russia to Beijing China which was insane oh, shit. It, it was totally good. insane totally the dining car on that train um, was run by these two old Russian guys and, you know, you always meet other travelers when you're traveling like this. And we, we met some backpackers from Finland, and they were trying to get to Mongolia. And, I mean, the train from Moscow to Beijing is like seven days long. And all we wanted to do was just bullshit and drink beer and play cards in a dining car. And for some reason, these two old guys in the dining car thought that we wanted to listen to, like, Russian disco music played at insane volume so you couldn't even hear yourself think <laughs> and trying to convince these guys no turn the music off we just want to play cards and drink beer which is which is nuts so you know we got to china we got to, went to china traveled all around china went down to vietnam traveled around there which was a lot of fun <laughs> hanoi was another place where it went to the symphony orchestra which is not world class but it was like five dollars to spend more than five dollars in hanoi on anything was pretty much impossible and and it was just it's just amazing wonderful experiences like when I was in this was so much fun in Hanoi um, Lisa and I were walking down the street in the middle of the af- middle of the afternoon and the local college lets out and they set up badminton nets uh, on the sidewalk so they can play badminton and I asked some kid if I could play in with them and he didn't know English and I didn't know Vietnamese and I just pointed to his racket and he's, you know, motioned, yes, of course. And I just played badminton for the afternoon with these college kids from Hanoi. And it was like, it was like amazing, just amazing experiences like that. And, and so finally we're in Shanghai and to get from Shanghai to back to the United States, um, you could book yourself on a freighter, which is what we did. And I took a, we took a freighter from Shanghai to San Francisco, which took like 18 days. And I think for 12 days, we didn't see any other land or, or marine animals. It was just us and the ocean for 12 days. And that, that was amazing too. I mean, the, the the rooms are kind of nice. They're clean. They don't have very big crews. You, You eat all your meals with the officers and the crew every day it was it was just and and those meals would last you know like two hours because all they wanted to do is just sit there and bullshit about whatever um there was a mild crisis on ship because the crews are germ i'm sorry the officers are german there was one polish guy but they had run out of curry ketchup and they were really the officers were really upset about that because curry ketchup to germans is like stadium mustard to clevelanders you know i mean it's not something that you want to run out of especially if you're at sea for three weeks and there's no way to get any more so but it was just it was just an amazing amazing trip and if if i went back i mean my favorite places are the baltics estonia and latvia uh stockholm i'd go to stockholm in a second uh, the Faroe Islands, I would go to in a second. I mean, I mean, it was just, I just love those places. And we, we made it. Nothing, we went all planned the way. In ad, nothing planned in advance. You just oh, no, we, cuffed, we, we I mean, planned you just cuffed, 
cuffed we, around we, in B and B's and stuff like that, or nice no, hotels. No, we we, or... we planned the trend. We planned it. Uh, it took a year to plan it, and you had to get visas sure. to go to certain countries like Russia, China, um, Vietnam. You needed visas, so mm-hmm. we had to plan it. I mean, you know, we had a we had a Russian visa, and we we were in Norway. We went all the way to the north of Norway, where the borders of Norway. Finland and Russia come together and I, I found out about this this place where you could hike it's called the tri border hike um, and, and it's about five miles long and it starts in Norway and, and you and you hike through this national park in Norway um, to where the the borders of the of Russia Finland and Norway all come together and there's there's this rock monument there but it's also a Norwegian sort of military encampment so you know a mile in we were met by norwegian military and you know they're friendly guys but sure, they had a lot yeah. of they, but they had a lot of guns i mean i never well, saw so many guns <clears throat> well they haven't had shit in to one do since world war ii i mean <laughs> no and they were friendly and they could speak perfect <laughs> sure. english and they said hey enjoy the hike but whatever you do do not cross into russia don't even put your hand over the border into russia and then when we got to the top of the hike where the monument's at, those guys were sitting there. They had they had a little camp. They were making coffee, offered us coffee. And, you know, there's the monument. And on one side of the monument is Norway. On the other side is Finland. And on the other side is Russia. And you could step into Finland if you want. But like I said, do not wave your hand even if for even a second over into Russia because you'll be arrested. Why? I even and, had like 10 guards fucking waiting for hikers and probably. shit? Probably. I mean, you Probably. couldn't see you <laughs> couldn't see them, but I'm sure they were there. And and let me tell you too, at the very beginning of that hike where you park your car, it is it is sort of a national park in Norway, but you are you're in the mi- you're in the middle of nowhere. I, I mean you're t- you're above the Arctic Circle, you're in the middle of nowhere. But let me tell you, that was like the best cell phone reception anywhere oh, in the entire world. And so thanks, Elon. You know, yeah, thanks, Norway. <laughs> <laughs> just sending up the satellites and getting yeah. it going yeah that's pretty freaking great oh yeah gosh man so uh, after all that you came back to cleveland you went back to reno you went back to chicago you lived in miami now you're in Brazil. Yeah. you're all over the freaking place yeah. um you, who was gerald moss and how did he, how did you interact what was that so like? so what when, when we got back when we got back from it took five months to go around the world and we got back um i got a phone call out of the blue from gerald moss and Gerald was a friend of mine at WOSR at Ohio State. And, you know, he, he was also involved in the music business. He went to places in the business that I could never hope to go. He was, I think, a vice president at Entertainment One, which is a large, who's a huge distributor. And he calls me up one day and says, um, what are you doing with the label? And I said, well, not much at the moment. I'm kind of wondering if I'm just going to set it aside and not just retire and not do it anymore. And he said, well, you know, if you're interested, if you have other releases that you're working on or are going to put together and you want to be distributed by Entertainment One, I can make it happen. And I was like, well, yeah, I, this is another, yeah, I play drums moment. Drums, yeah. yeah. And we so, you know, uh, I hung up the phone and then I thought, okay, well, I got a distributor, but now I got to make some records. And so, <laughs> and so I came up with the idea for the Platters to Cuyahoga series, which, again, were reissues and retrospectives. But I wanted to take a, a deeper look. I wanted to go beyond uh, 1983. And so we started looking at sort of the, like the, the you know, the proto-punk, pre-punk era in Cleveland and, and found this guy, Robert Bensick, who, in my opinion, is sort of the unsung hero of the Cleveland Underground. He had this. He, he was in the Monks uh, in Toledo when he was a kid, and they, they, you know, he had he had hits and and toured on sort of the teeny bop circuit. And he had moved to Cleveland, I think, in 1973 uh, to go to Cleveland State. He was he was an artist and a sculptor. And when he's a senior. At Cleveland State, he wins the Student Art Artist of the Year Award. And he was living in the Plaza, which is a, like a famous apartment slash artist commune in Cleveland. And so when you when you win the Art, Student Artist of the Year Award at Cleveland State at that time, 
you get to put together your own gallery show. And instead of putting together a gallery show of his art and his sculptures, he decides to put a band together. And the band he puts together is High Maya with Scott Krause and Alan Ravenstein and with synth synthesizers purchased from Alan Howarth. And Alan Howarth becomes as huge, had, had a synthesizer store in Cleveland, which was probably the only place you could buy synthesizers between New York and L.A. And eventually he moves to L.A. and becomes this huge sound artist. I think he gets nominated for Oscars, teams up with John Carpenter and becomes John Carpenter's um, collaborator on soundtracks. And so, so Robert Bensick does this performance of High Maya at his, uh, at his student art show which becomes the very, I think, the very last student art show because it, it causes it's this huge fiasco. But to me, it's sort of like like the really the beginning of the you know, of the Cleveland proto punk scene. I mean, it's it's High Maya, Electric Eels, Mirrors, Styrenes, but but High Maya was kind of forgotten about. And so you know, we we put together a High Maya release. Robert had also recorded another record. Uh, with Scott Krause um, and Tom Herman under the name of the Robert Bensick Band uh, under the promise that someone was going to give it to some big producer in L.A. And for whatever reason, Alan Holworth uh, came in possession of the master. No one had the master. And so I, I found Alan Holworth in L.A. And I'm like, well, this, this dude's like huge. You know, he's not going to take a phone call from me. So I find him. I find his phone number. I call him. And what do you know? He answers the phone and says, hey, I'm, I'm busy on a project, but I will have my assistant look for the master. And I promise I'll get back to you. And three months later, I get this email out of the blue from Alan Hoar say, hey, I found the master. And he sends me a photo of it. And it still has this like note on it that Robert Bensick had taped on it. Like, Alan, could you give this master to someone in LA <laughs> so we, you know we, we we put that record together um, uh, you know it, it, there was a number of other record we did a Mr. Stress blues band record talk to me about them for a second because well, was... you, know, you know Mr. Stress um, people probably people in Cleveland probably remember them mainly from their Euclid Tavern residence where they would play you know they would pack the house two or three nights a week, but they were at that point in the in the eighties and into the nineties. They were basically just a blues standards band that one of those bands that you know it was a cover band, but you could you could pay the bills with the way they did it because they could pack the house any night of the week. But before then, I mean, they had started out in the in the mid to late sixties on the Case Western campus. They were kind of involved in with student activists on the, on the Case Western campus. And they were kind of like a hot up and coming blues, garage blues rock and roll band. And, you know, and they had all these recordings from back in the day. And, you know, um, we got in touch with Mr. Stress himself. And, you know, he, he was, you know, he shared his recordings with us. Uh, Colin Dussault, who's a, a, a blues musician in Cleveland, uh, still there, still performs. You know, he he was helping uh, Bill Miller, Mr. Stress, uh, with his you know business and recordings, and so we were able to put those put that together as well. That that was part of the Platters to Cuyahoga series. Um, John Morton contributed some recordings for that series. There was an X Black X Blank X record that he you know allowed us to release as part of that series and so it was it was a lot of fun at that time we also we also did a guns retrospective the guns were probably the most important and influential hardcore band from that 80s uh er, hardcore era in cleveland and so you know i, I really I, i'm really glad gerald called me out of the blue because i might n have never done those records but I'm glad that he did call because I did do those records, and they're just, you know, we, were, I, I had someone, I had Nick Blakey helping me and Andrew Russ helping me. They were interns 
helping me put together liners and Nick wrote some fantastic deeply researched liners for those releases and I needed help at that time also with mail order business because the mail order business got kind of bigger so Cheeseburger came on and joined the crew and did you know handled all the mail order stuff uh, and did all the shipping for me and so it, it was kind of a it was kind of a well-oiled machine with a lot of good deeply researched uh, releases that that really chronicle uh, Cleveland Ohio say 1968 to 1975 yeah I mean you know and so I think that's a good way to segue into the story the final story one of the final stories if not the final story you told and well, that's the Peter yeah. Lochner box yeah. and um, that we could I mean that might be an episode in itself but <laughs> and yeah. I think we should do that but I mean you can give me I'm sure five ten minutes or whatever whatever yeah. you feel necessary um yeah I give the you the construction of that yeah 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 the short of it is or or let's say the medium of it is um you know I I did the rocket from the tombs retrospective Peter Lochner was a member of rocket from the tombs he was a principal songwriter with with David and Cheetah and uh, Peter, you know, is sort of a mythical, legendary figure in the history of Cleveland rock and roll. He only lived to be 27 years old. But um, besides Rocket from the Tombs, he had put together numerous, numerous uh, bands that might have lasted a couple gigs. Um, some lasted maybe a year. He did a lot of solo performances he really started in the late 60s and recorded up until his death um and and so i kind of thought you know i really want to tell a story about cleveland you know something unique and informative and comprehensive and definitive and it's something that you know david had put together with rocket from the tombs and i wanted to put together myself for something else and i thought well you know peter's recordings um other than the rocket from the tombs retrospective that we did were often bootlegged there was nothing officially licensed ever and so i thought you know this would be the thing that i could do because this guy was a legend and there was a lot of myths and half truths about his life and I, I could do it justice you know if, if I just had time to put it together I could do it justice so there was a lot of things that had to happen first of all we had to put together all the materials um, and that that was difficult because um, finding masters was hard to do and getting them into a form that could be released commercially was hard to do but but we did it and then uh finding the estate um that is the person that holds the rights to his recordings and convincing them that this was an important project and the rights holder at the time was tim wright who was the original bass player for pair ubu and then he had moved to new york he was a member of the band dna and i found him uh tim was easily convinced he knew the importance of the story that i wanted to tell and he knew the importance of the recordings that i wanted to release and so tim was enthusiastic about it tim would call me up every so often to talk about the project you know it, it was really great to hear from him uh you know i'd answer the phone and the first word out of his mouth was franco and uh he would tell me these stories about life with Peter and life in New York and he was Tim was also a traveler and he would travel to Central America two or three times a year and he would tell me these crazy stories filled with these belly laughs he had this unique laugh and I would hang you know I talked to him for a half hour 45 minutes it was always about that long I would hang up with him and invariably every single time he would call back five minutes later I forgot to tell you something and then he Franco and then he would tell me another story along with this laugh of his 
And it went, you know, it went on like that for a couple of years while we were trying to figure out what the project was going to look like. And, and Tim got ill. Tim passed away, which was, it was incredibly sad because, I mean, there was so much work that we had put into it. And he was really eager to see it, you know, see the light of day. And it would just never, we, we unfortunately just never got to that point. But his, his life partner, Marianne Livchak, she, she was the sort of the original, I think, manager, maybe kind of like manager of Per Ubu. And, you know, she and Tim were life partners. And she saw the importance of this work. And, you know, it, it took some time to really flush it out with her as to what it was going to be. But once we figured out what the songs, what songs we were going to include and what stories we were going to tell and what, you know, photographs and graphics we were going to include, then we had to track down all these people that collaborated with Peter or who took photographs and license all this stuff from him. And, it, and that took a lot of time. I mean, we, we were... We were six or seven years into this project before we could even start licensing it. And I think there was probably 25 different musicians who we had a license from. And some of those people we had already worked with. Scott Krause, Robert Bensick, um, Pete Sinks, Mike Sands, uh, we, you know, David, of course, Cheetah, Craig Bell. Um, but some of these people we had never worked with before, and we had to track them down. At least one person, we didn't even have the person's name. We had his nickname. No one could remember his name. Spa John, who I'm really happy I tracked down because Spa John was a really important central figure in the Hessler street scene. What Hessler Street in Cleveland is like, was like the sort of hippie, capital of Cleveland you know that and Coventry Street competed it seemed like they competed with, with each other to, to sort of out hippie each other and Spa John was the manager of Tiny Alice I believe and he also recorded with Peter one or two songs and we wanted to use one of those and you know I, I, I found him he had great stories great photographs from the area as it turned out Spa John um he not only was the manager of Tiny Alice, but he had a waterbed store that he ran out of his basement on Hessler Street. And then he wanted to diversify, so he got into leather clothing, you know, nice. <laughs> which doesn't, doesn't, seem to be, it doesn't seem to be obvious to me that that's what the next well, step in your business know. would be. But, but hey, in, 19, in 1972, that, would, that made perfect sense. Sure. And so we finally got everyone tracked down. We finally got everyone signed off. Uh, we put we put the box set together, released it. It's a huge hit. We sell tons and tons of it. I think we did Peter justice. I think we told his story. I I, I really had thought at that point that, you know, I I told my Cleveland story, and I didn't. I, I think it was the perfect sort of denouement for me. You know, when I, when I was. I was an English major at Ohio State, and what really drew me to literature were denouements. You know, I, I, I liked uh, stories that, you know, r wrapped it all up in the ending. But I also like stories that, in movies, that don't wrap it up in the ending, and you have to make your own denouement. And so, you know, Smogvale didn't have an obvious ending. I had to make it up. And so I thought this was, this was the perfect denouement to, to Smogvale, the perfect way uh, to end it. You know, I had my, I had my unique Cleveland story that, that people really were interested in, that, that, that cleared up a lot of misconceptions and myths and contributed to Peter's legend. And so I thought, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think there's another story out there that, that can top this. I don't think there's another story out there that I can really do justice for. So I think it really is time to step away from the business and and call it a day. And I thought I'm I'm on top here. I don't really owe anyone any money. Uh, everyone has made some money. It's a good time to step away. And so I made the decision 
after consulting with my wife, who's always been, you know, my partner in this business, that, you know, it's a good time to step away and, and, you know, I'm hoping someone else picks up the mantle. I, I never really wanted to be unique in, in this business. I, I, when it comes to reissues and retrospectives and stories about Northeast Ohio, I never really wanted to be unique, you know, and, and so someone like Robert Griffin at SCAT, who does some of this as well, I'm really happy because he does it at such a high quality. I'm really happy that someone else is doing it. And I, and I hope others come along too and, and, and really give Cleveland its justice as I have tried to do. That, that's well, really my hope. You guys both have, and, um, and we'll be waiting for you to play drums in the new <laughs> band called Denouement. Uh, that we've got. But I will say, you know, look, Frank, it, it's been great talking to you. And during your tenure at Smogville, you were always a gentleman. You were always above board. You were always ethical. You were always approachable to me. You were transparent. You were knowledgeable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck you. I'm gonna give you your shit because I'm telling you, it's it, it, it was. Uh, I'll go on as long as I want. You were awesome, and you and Robert um, both came through um, for Cleveland in a big way. Because you know, I'm not gonna mention names, but before there was a Smog Vale and before there was a Scat, Dramet and Hudson. Because I wasn't gonna mention names. You know, they were releasing records, but they were hoping to cash in. You know. Uh, and they were nice guys, and they had, they, they were certainly sincere about the genre, obviously, but they were pirates, you know. I mean, they wanted to take your fucking money, and they wanted to get those. And those are my words; those are ears. I can fucking say it. It's my goddamn job. But, um, but from a label perspective, you and 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 Robert both realized way more success than anything they ever did as labels, as seminal as some of Johnny's releases were. We can't match the success that you guys would, would have had. But you guys did this in a completely ethical way. And um, you you were straight up with all the bands. And, you know, I just want to say on behalf of all the bands that were ever on your label, um, someone that was on one for, on your label and did comps, uh, get a comp on your label, you know, I'd say thank you a million times. As Mort would say, thank you times infinity. Um, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, you never told the story for you. You know, it never became, it was never about fucking Frank Maseri and Smogvale. It was no. always articulated with the music and your contributions to the music scene in Cleveland. Not just the punk scene, but the Cleveland music scene are greatly appreciated. And that legacy is going to fucking live on forever, dude. And, uh, you know, all the stories that you've told me about Smogvale, you know, this one's the best because this one is the one that never got told. And this one was the one about you. So um, I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody, your fans, you know, the people that bought your records, the people that recorded for you, the people that worked with you, from the artists to the um, to the to the sound guys to to the bands to everybody. But I want you to close this out. People sick of listening to me talk. Um, so give me some final thoughts. Take well, the wheel and hit well, the thanks, tarmac. Mark. I, you know, I, I, and... appreciate, I appreciate your comments. You know, I mean, we've always been about the artists, the bands and the fans and so you know thank you i really appreciate that and so what what i want to leave you with is i wanted to make this really special and so i wanted to leave you with one last uh peter lochner track and this one is not on the box set so this is a completely exclusive unreleased track it's from a band that peter had put together uh fins with scott kraus and robert bensick um I think they had played one gig. I know they had played one gig. They played the Coventry Coventry Street Fair, I think in 1974 or 75. And I mean, this this even though it's a cover song, it's the perfect Cleveland sound. I mean, it's got it's got everything that makes Cleveland proto punk and punk rock and rock and roll what it is. And so, I'm happy to share it with you. I'm happy to share it with the fans. And it's it's my thanks to everyone. Cool. What's the name of the cut? The In Crowd. Oh, good. We can listen to uh, five different versions of it, and this was probably yeah. the best. Yes. Frank, give my best to Lisa, and Will do. it was awesome talking to you. And uh, we'll thanks, be Mark. In touch soon, my brother. Thank you. O H. Have a gr- I O. <laughs> <laughs> be good, man. Bye.
And we are finished. <laughs>